All right, let's get back to pigmentation. Uh, we're going to designate this whole spotlight on Arbutin, right, Gloria? Yep. So what awesome. we wrapped up is um, on combination therapies. Yes. And when we were doing it, uh, doing research on that, um, we found that recently um, what seems to be super popular across all these brands are um, transamic acid, azelaic acid, and Arbutin. Uh, we have an episode basically mm-hmm. dedicated to transamic and uh, okay. azelaic acid. Sorry. So check out the episode mm-hmm. here. And that's why I decided to take a closer look at Arbutin. Um, Let's do it. I'm pretty sure the ingredient became really popular also because of the ordinary. Mm. They have a 2% serum that's mm-hmm. basically just Arbutin. Um, and solvent. Yeah, they have one that's Arbutin, and they have one that's like 2% Arbutin with 8% L-ascorbic acid, and propane diol, all in propane diol, 90% propane diol, <laughs> stop it, <laughs> stop the propane diol. Oh god, oh god, we've lost Gloria, uh, we've lost her. <laughs> just, oh. Alright, alright, anyway, right. uh, Arbutin, Arbutin. So, why Arbutin got its fame is because it is a structural cousin to hydroquinone. Mm-hmm. And since hydroquinone has regulatory shenanigans, people are like, hmm, the next best thing. Let's just attach a sugar molecule to it. Yeah, like <laughs> add a tail, add a little hat, yeah. whatever, right? Boom. Um, yeah. So the funny thing is Arbutin has this reputation of being a hydroquinone um, replacement almost yeah. just because how similar it is. But there isn't nearly as much data on it compared to hydroquinone. Let's just say we're not giving it the gold standard label just yet. Yes. So there's a few different versions of Arbutin. The most common one is alpha Arbutin. Mm. And then there's also beta Arbutin, which is... um. So in the EU, the regulation goes uh, alpha, you can use it at max at 2%, and beta 7%. Mm. And then there's one more called deoxy Arbutin, which you can sketchily buy on Amazon, but note that it is banned in the eu mm-hmm. mostly because it turns into uh hydroquinone is considered very effective yeah. we won't get into deoxy because you can't it's hard to find it anyway we like to stick to the eu's um safety guidelines they usually champion um they're a lot more strict on it than um the rest of the Definitely world very so vanilla. we look to them for guidelines yeah yeah so with alpha and beta arbutin what's interesting is and this oh it's gonna get very nerdy but step one to a good um, anti-pigmentation product, and that goes for anything, any um, any molecules and also any extract. So liquor shoe extract, mulberry, the, uh, the ones that's known for this have all been through something called the tyrosinase inhibition test. Mm-hmm. So going back to nerdy biology, tyrosinase is an enzyme that kind of decides uh, it doesn't know how fast your cells are producing melanin. So by slowing it down, telling it to take a chill pill. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So think of it as the, it's like a, like the controller, you know, and, yeah. and it's what's going to drive that melanin um, deposit, yeah. I guess, that rate. Yeah. So having tyrosinase inhibitor is like having a co-worker smoking weed popping in, like, what's the hurry, guys? <laughs> I'm just going, smooth, come here, smooth. lay down, have Bro. a moment, let's just chill out here for a second. Let's talk about meaning of life We're for not a speaking like we smoke weed. <laughs> yeah, but, um... <laughs> But Arbutin, um, both alpha and beta have been through these tests. Now, the problem with all things science is, especially skin science, is sometimes there's different ways to do things, mm-hmm. and there's not necessarily a consensus as to what is the best way to do it. That's actually classic science. Um, right. Everything is exploratory, it requires a ton of experimentation, and a lot of just like reinforcing, retesting to prove that that data is actually true. And fun fact, the first step uh, of validating this ingredient mm-hmm. being done or uh, on testing to see if it stops, slows down tyrosinase, a lot of times it's um they pull uh they pull cells from mushrooms. Mm-hmm. So yeah, again, kind of goes back to our antioxidant episode. When you start with yeah. a with a test subject like a mushroom, yeah, does that affect translate to human skin? It's a bit of a leap of Exactly. Um, We time and time again always talk about why in vitro data is just more of like a sniff test. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like just to say, okay, is this does this actually even do anything? And then after that is when you do all the hard work to show that 
it makes its way down and actually targets tyrosinase. And also, you want to target the tyrosinase that's used in humans, you know? Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Arbutin, the problem is between alpha and beta, mm -hmm. there's some sort of, some conflicting data on mm -hmm. which one's better. Yeah. Mostly the more common one and the more common one that most brands put their money behind is alpha. alpha. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not to say beta doesn't do anything because there are also tests that show beta does do something. Mm -hmm. um, and the good thing is, there is um, clinical evidence. Yeah, and I was also going to mention, um, from what I believe, that in EU regulation, the concentration of alpha versus beta is different. Yes, alpha is a, um, capped at 2% mm -hmm. and beta is at 7%. Mm -hmm. And that's why you'll see um, the ordinary products capping yeah, it at 2%. Yeah. So I believe the good molecule has a 7% beta, but beta is not as popular in terms of um, products. So the good thing about arbutin is it actually it has human clinical results. Um, like we said, there's a lot of things that's kind of promoted, paraded around as miracles, and it's only mm. been studied on mushrooms. And mm. good thing is that's not the case here. We did find a, a, a study that has all of our favorite words. So it is a <laughs> randomized placebo control, mm -hmm. double blind trial involving 102 women. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Um, they had pigmentation problems, and the study group they divided into fifty four each. Yeah. They applied these products um, twice a day. Um, the the test product has a final concentration of two point five one percent arbutin, mm -hmm. but that's really interesting because it does end up going above the regulation percentage, mm, yeah. but not by that much. So it gives us some indication. And then the great thing is we love studies are placebo controlled mm -hmm. um so the study does have a placebo and it showed that clinical uh, improvement was observed in 70 uh, 76 percent of female patients with a melasma and uh 56 percent of the patients with sunspots so um yeah it absolutely it indicates pretty positively that it does work compared yeah. to placebo so definitely worthy of a try agreed I don't know if it's like that great used alone though. Yeah. That's always my problem with it. I think it's again, like I just sticking to like what we've said before, like the best approach is a cocktail approach. Mm -hmm. So definitely a green light for incorporating it into your routine, but don't let this be just the sole champion ingredient. Also, why can't you include AHAs? Come on. Like, everyone should have it at this point. Like, you know, and so I think, yeah, that I totally agree with that sentiment. Yeah, so we're going to highlight a few products here that have our butin in a combo. So yeah. definitely scope it out. Yeah. And know that if you see extracts like Uva Ursi extract, <laughs> that's the extract that contains our butin. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh. Uh, is, so here's my thing with extracts, though. Usually, that means that it's a significantly less amount of arbutin. So, right. is there? I we kind of talk about how extracts are very difficult because um, the actual active concentration is unknown. Mm -hmm. you usually, need a lot more, and the actual concentration of that the extract is also hard to gauge. So, I'm just curious if there's any advice for people who find uva ursi in their product. So interestingly, plenty stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there's quite a few that shows pretty good data yeah. on um, on hyperpigmentation. Yeah. Uh, Uva RC is one. Yeah. Um, there's licorice root extract. Um, mulberry has some great data, and then there's bisabolol, which is derived from German chamomile that we love. Oh, we love we use. <laughs> yeah. But the problem, as Victoria mentioned, a lot of it, you it's hard to tell what kind of activity mm -hmm. they're using it at. Uh, what's their sourcing? So for me, my take is always like, it's honestly great to have, but if that's the only active a product has, then... So consider these as your secondary actives. Right. Awesome to find in your pigmentation products. Do not ride on that as oh, your... Yes. Don't gamble solely on that. Um, and I, I also want to mention, like, if you do start looking into plant extracts with for brightening or even pigmentation benefits, a lot of them are tested in cocktail. Yes. as well like for visible we love but it, again we also see that more as a secondary active to all your heavy hitters so again reminder. Right. so again so, uh, this is a patient game but it's also an active yeah. cocktails game yeah. i i oh. the reality is all these ingredients that we mentioned transamic acid uh elagic acid arbutin um kojic acid all these extracts 
You will find it in some random jumble combination yeah. somewhere, right? It's like that. It's kind of like when Monica was teaching Chandler. <laughs> it's like there's sometimes you find a one, two, three, a three, four, a five, seven, <laughs> six, seven. <laughs> yeah, that's such a good point. And I was also gonna just like speak from personal experience, like when. I feel like people who deal with acne, they're used to a much quicker timeline mm. of like when an acne arises and when it goes away. Mm. Then you deal with the pigmentation part and it is so frustrating because it takes so long to fade. And the best mentality is to set it and forget it. Set your routine, forget about it and let it just like keep to that diligent routine and just let it, you know, do its thing and fade, you know, and so... I think like that's kind of there's there's definitely like a behavior behavioral part to this as well. Yeah. Um, but I can guarantee you both Gloria and I, we both deal with our own pigmentation problems. And um, as much as might seem a long time, like it will be worth it. And then. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just want to highlight how ridiculous some of these cocktails get. Yeah. I found a great paper that goes a novel cream formulation containing niacinamide of 4%, arbutin 3%, visible 1%, retinol aldehyde at 0.05% for treatment of epidermal mal- uh, melasma. <laughs> yes, this highlights the truth. Just throw things at it and see what happens. Yeah. That's um, the truth. So yeah, awesome. kind of to wrap up this me, I hope it's a little helpful in terms of breaking down. Yeah. We'll put this in blog format for everyone to reference. So remember, patience is key. Yeah. Stick to your routine basics. And also, when you can't take it anymore, it is time to see a derm. Because yeah. now hydroquinone, tretinoin, like things that will get you that more visible results, even laser treatments, mm-hmm. those are only available to you in office. That's so. a great point.